what God deserves. Amen. At some point, you're going to have to open your doors and, and get out and lift your hands up and give God the glory that is due his name. At some point, we're not going to be bound by fear, but by grace. Father, we come in the name of Jesus. We do thank you for the grace that you have given us on this day. Our Father who art in heaven, holy is your name. There is none like you in all the earth. You are incomparable. none like you for you are set apart as holy Lord we pray that your kingdom would come and your will would be done here on earth in the same way that it is done in heaven in heaven we know that you are the king of glory you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Lord, you are the ruler of heaven and earth. So we pray that your will would be done. Father, we pray right now that your word will penetrate our hearts. That you would cause us to not just be hearers of your word, but to be doers also. Lord, will you block out all distractions so that we might hear your voice clearly. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. Lord, my strength and my redeemer. God, we honor you on this day. We thank you that you are Jehovah Jireh. You continue to be our provider. You are Jehovah Ra. Lord, you are our great shepherd, and because you are our great shepherd, we shall have no wants. You are Jehovah Rapha. You are the God who healeth thee. And even when we're all alone, and we think that you are not there, you are Jehovah Shama, the Lord who is always there so God we honor you on this day as El Olam the everlasting God for the word says from everlasting to everlasting thou art God Lord we honor you on this morning we thank you for the beautiful sunshine we thank you for the breeze that we can feel. Lord, even the birds give honor and glory to your name. So God, this morning we pray that you would have your way. That you would speak to our hearts. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. God, we hear you. We are living in perilous times and you have our attention. So speak, Lord. Our servants desire to hear your voice. we need to hear your voice speak with clarity through this your servant it 
It is in the powerful name of Jesus Christ that we pray and ask all of these things. And all of the saints of God said amen. Amen. This morning we will be looking at 2 Timothy in this series, Passing the Baton, looking at 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 8 through 13. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 8 through 13. I want to begin reading at verse 1 and read up to verse 7 and then we will move forward. On last week, Brother Kent reminded us that Paul is in Rome and he is in prison and he does not foresee getting out of prison. And so he writes these words to his protege, Timothy. Paul understands that Timothy is going to be facing persecution and so he says this to his protege, You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. The things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. And then he says, Suffer hardship with me as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No soldier in active service entangles himself in the affairs of everyday life, that he may please the one who enlisted him as a soldier. Also, if anyone competes as an athlete, he does not win the prize unless he competes according to the rules. Verse 6 says, the hardworking farmer ought to be the first to receive his share of the crops. Then he says in verse 7, consider what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in anything, in everything. This morning I have to admit that I was torn all of this week. I was torn about whether I needed to drop this sermon and this series, Passing the Baton, to address what's been going on in our nation, in our land, in the world. My heart has been torn with grief over the death of George Floyd, Ahmaud Jamil, Tatiana Jefferson, and so many others. My heart has been torn over the fabricated call of Amy Cooper to the police on Chris Cooper, who is a, or was a bird watcher. My mind was saturated with the question, what do we do and where do we go from here? I thought deeply about the core issues, which can be boiled down to one word. Now I know you're probably thinking that one word is racism. But it is not racism, certainly racism is an issue. But the one word is sin. It does us no good to say that racism is a result of sin without offering a solution to the problem. And so what is the solution to the problem of sin? I struggled with this all week, what is the answer to this, the problem, sin, and the solution is the Word of God. It took me right back to the Word of God because there can be no life change, there can be no dealing with sin except by means of the Word of God. That is why we will continue on in this series Although we might protest and be angry about what's going on in America, the priority for the believer of Jesus Christ is to preach the word in season and out of season. Circumstances are going to come, but we must not allow the word of God to be second. 
secondary to our protest about justice. Certainly we want justice, but the word of God is the only thing that can change the hearts of mankind. Having said that, there are three things that I want to highlight today as we look at 2 Timothy chapter 2 verses 8 through 13. There are three points I want to make this morning. The word of God causes liberation. The word of God causes liberation. Not only does the word of God cause liberation, but the word of God causes salvation. It causes liberation and then it causes salvation. And lastly, the word of God causes transformation. Remember, Paul finds himself in a cold cell with chains and knows that he is going to die at the hands of Nero. So he pins this letter to his son in the ministry, Timothy. And he wants to pass the baton and encourage Timothy to be strong. He wants to encourage Timothy to not be fearful, but commit that which had been entrusted to him to faithful men who would in turn do the same thing and trust that word to faithful men who would entrust the word to other faithful men. Paul knows that Timothy is going to face persecution. Paul knows that he is going to die on account of the gospel of Jesus Christ, but Paul also knows that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to those that believe. He understands that the word is what changes people's lives. It's one thing to say, I love the Lord. He heard my cry and he pitted every groan. But does the word saturate your life so that it causes transformation? Look at 2 Timothy chapter 2 verses 8 through 13. We will... See that we need in these dark hours, what we need is a liberation that goes beyond what the, uh, the government can give us. We need a salvation that goes beyond the grave and ultimately we need the word to transform our lives, causing us to live in such a way that others might glorify God the Father in heaven. Second Timothy chapter 2 verse 8 and 9 the word causes liberation after giving Timothy the encouragement in verse 7 he says he uses these three analogies an analogy of a soldier of an athlete and of a farmer and then he says in verse 7 consider what I say for the Lord will give you understanding and everything and then Paul gives Timothy this next imperative throughout the book of 2nd Timothy you see several imperatives where a imperative is where it's a command it's where God is where, where Paul is telling Timothy this is something that you must do so he says remember Jesus Christ risen from the dead. Let's just stop right there. As we go through this world, as we go through the difficulties of life, it's easy for us to look at the, the wind and the waves and the storms that keep on raging in our lives. It's, it's easy to look from the left to the right and get caught up in your circumstances and Paul understands that. And so he says to Timothy, remember the Lord Jesus. Remember the Lord Jesus. Who has risen from the dead. That same Jesus Christ that has risen from the dead. We have been raised with him. Empowered by him. And we can go through whatever the enemy puts in our path. Because of Jesus 
The power that raised Jesus is a power that we live by. It is a power to get us to walk right. It is a power to get us to talk right. It is a power to endure in times like these. He says, remember, Jesus Christ risen from the dead, a descendant of David. He's highlighting the fact that Jesus was the promised Messiah. The Messiah had to come through the lineage of David and he's reminding him not only of Jesus being the Messiah but his humanity. Remember Jesus Christ risen from the dead, descendant of David according to my gospel. I like that he said it was his gospel because the gospel had uh, 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 it had uh, an impact in his life. It was his gospel. It wasn't his grandmother's gospel. It was his. It was his personal relationship with God. The word liberates, he says in verse 9, this gospel, my gospel for which I suffer hardship even to imprisonment as a criminal. He uses this word criminal looking back at the scene when Jesus was on the cross and he had two criminals on one on his left side and one on his right side. Paul says because of the gospel I have been treated as a criminal. Now Paul is not complaining about his state. He is simply encouraging Timothy to fight the good fight. Remember Jesus Christ. His word liberates. His life liberates. He's risen from the dead. He's a descendant of David according to my gospel for which I suffer hardship even to imprisonment as a criminal. But I love this. He says, but the word of God is not imprisoned. Listen to me. It doesn't matter what's going on in this world. It doesn't matter what the enemy has tried to do to do away with the word of God. The word of God cannot be imprisoned. When Paul is in prison and this is his uh, his is his last message to Timothy but there were other times when he was locked up and he was chained to prison guards and he was sharing the gospel even where you go no matter where you go the gospel goes with you and there is nowhere where the gospel cannot reach Ephesians chapter 2 verses 1 through 8 says it this way talking about the word causing liberation we think of liberation as marching and certainly marching is necessary but the ultimate liberation that we need is a liberation of our souls because one of these days we're going to be laid in a box and put in the ground and we thank God that death does not have victory over the believer because we have ultimate liberation. Paul says this in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 180 he says and you were dead in your trespasses and sin and which you formerly walked. Talking about liberation. There's a way that we used to walk that we ought not walk anymore because we have been liberated by the word of God. And you were dead in your trespasses and sin in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. He says, among them, we too all formerly lived in the lust of our flesh indulging in the desires of the flesh and of the mind and were by nature children of wrath even as the rest but God being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us even when we were dead in our transgressions
actions made us alive together with Christ. It is by grace that you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That's what liberation really is all about. We've been raised with Christ. We've been seated with him in the heavenly places positionally. He says, so that in the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith and not as a result of works so that no one may boast says in verse 10 for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them we've been liberated to walk in the works of God. Paul says this in Romans chapter 6 verse 1 through 8 talking about liberation. In chapter 5 he talks about we're justified by faith in Jesus Christ alone. Chapter 6 7 and 8 he is going to talk about sanctification. He asked the question, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? May it never be. How shall we who die to sin still live in it? Or do you not know all of us who have been baptized into Christ have been baptized into his death? Therefore we have been buried with him through baptism into death so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the God Father so we too might walk in the newness of life. That's what it means to be liberated to walk in the newness of life. The word of God is not changed and because the word of God has changed us, we should walk in the newness of life. He says, for if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we will also be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him. Liberation. In order that our body of sin might be done away with. So that we would no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died is freed from sin. We won't get the liberation that we need from the White House. We won't get the liberation that we need from the penthouse. We get liberation from the word of God, which frees us from sin. The word of God causes liberation. And the word of God also causes salvation. Listen to me. We are going to leave this place at some time. At some point, we are going to leave this body and all of the decisions that we've made on this side of heaven will be sealed. Paul goes on to say in verse 10 here in 2 Timothy chapter 2, for this reason I endure all things for the sake of those who are chosen. Paul is saying, listen, I am sitting in this cold, dungy cell, dingy cell, and I'm doing and doing this for the sake of those who are chosen. I want to remind you this morning that you didn't choose God, but he chose you. 
Listen to me. And he didn't choose you when you were at your best. He chose you while you were dead in your trespasses and your sins. You had nothing to offer. And he still chose you. Listen, if that alone doesn't motivate you to live a righteous life, I don't know what will. The word of God causes salvation. He says this, I endure all things for the sake of those who are chosen so that they also may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus and with it eternal glory. So we're living this life really for the next one because we're just, the, uh, a death for the believer is not a period but a comma transitioning us to the next point of life and that is eternal life that is in Christ Jesus. The word of God causes salvation. Philippians chapter 1 verse 12 says this now I want you to know brethren that my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel so that in my imprisonment in the cause of Christ I become well known throughout the whole Praetorian Guard and to everyone else Paul is preaching the gospel in the circumstances that he is in he says it's become well known to everyone else in verse 14 in that most of the brethren trusting in the Lord because of my imprisonment have far more courage to speak the word of God without fear. They understand that even though Paul is in prison, the word is not in prison. He says some and verse 15 of Philippians chapter 1. Some to be sure are preaching Christ even from envy and strife, but some also from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition rather than from pure motives, thinking to cause me distress in my imprisonment what then he says only that in every way whether in pretense or in truth that Christ is proclaimed and this and in this I rejoice yes and I will rejoice for I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayers and the provision of the spirit of Jesus Christ now at the time that he was writing this to the Philippian church, he knew that he would get out of prison, but by the time he is writing 2 Timothy, he knows that he will not get out of prison. He will die for the gospel of Jesus Christ. He says, still, yes, I will rejoice, for I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayers and the provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ according to my earnest expectation and hope that I will not be put to shame in anything but with all boldness Christ even now as always be exalted in my body whether by life or by death. Paul understands that to live is Christ and to die is gain because he has salvation we don't have to fear death we don't have to fear what people might say about us what people might do to our body to our bodies he says listen i don't fear the ones who fear the body who can do things to my body, but I fear the one who can do something to my body and my soul. Right. The word of God causes liberation. I don't have to walk in fear. The word of God causes salvation. 
That means that I am secure in Christ. No matter what's going on, I can be assured that I am secure in Christ. And lastly, the word of God causes liberation. The word of God causes salvation. And the word of God causes transformation. Verses 11 through 13. He says this. It is a trustworthy statement. Paul is saying you can take this to the bank. It's trustworthy. And then he gives four conditional, conditional if clauses. And these are powerful clauses. The first clause that he mentions here in verse 11, he says, For if we died with him, we will also live with him. <laughs> if we died with Christ, we will also live with Christ. Romans chapter 6, once again, gives us a reminder of Paul. We're no longer slaves to sin. And he goes on to say, here in chapter 6 of Romans, starting at verse 4. Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death. That's our unity with Christ. We've been buried with him through the baptism into death so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in the newness of life. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we will also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin may be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died is freed from sin. Then he goes on to say, Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that, Christ has been raised from the dead is never to die again. Death no longer is master over him. And because death is no longer master over him, death is no longer master over us. For death, he says, for the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ. I still got those cat reflexes. There we go. All right, we good. And so the first if clause is addressing this is a trustworthy statement that if we die with Christ, we will also live with Christ. That brings us to verse 12. Here's the second conditional clause. He says this, if we endure, we will also reign with him. If we endure, we will also reign with Christ. If we endure what, you might ask? Remember that Paul is writing to Timothy and Paul is in prison at this time. Paul knows that as a believer, the fate of the believer could be in a prison. It could be death. It could be martyrdom. And so Paul is helping Timothy to understand that you must endure. In fact, he tells him earlier on, the things that you have seen and heard from me committed to faithful men who will do the same. You've got to pass the baton, Timothy. You've got to endure hardships. 
if we endure, we will also reign with him. Mark 13, 13 says it this way. Jesus is talking to his disciples. Let's go back to verse 9. It says, be on guard for they will deliver you to the courts and you will be flogged in the synagogues and you will stand before governors and kings for my sake as a testimony to them the gospel must first be preached to all nations when there's arrest you hand you will be handed over do not worry beforehand what you will say but say whatever is given you in that hour for it is not you who speak but it is the spirit brothers will betray brother to death and a father his child and children will rise up against parents and have them put to death it's mark 13 13 says this you will be treated by all you will be hated by all because of my name but the one who endures to the end he will be saved it's important that you understand that we are not working for salvation but the ones who endure proves that they have been raised with Christ and that they are united with Christ in baptism raised to walk in the newness of life Paul is encouraging Timothy to endure and lastly here in Revelation 22 verse 5 it says then he showed me a river the water of life clear as crystal coming from the throne of God and the Lamb of God in the middle of his street on either side of the river was a tree of life bearing 12 kinds of fruit yielding its fruit every month and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nation there will no longer be any curse and the throne of God and the Lamb be in it and his bond servants serve him and they will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads and there will no longer be any night and there will be no need of light for the lamp nor the light of the sun because the Lord God will illuminate them and listen it says here and they will reign forever and ever Listen, if you endure with Christ, you will reign with Christ. The third conditional clause here is in, it says, if we deny him, he also will deny us. If we deny him, he will deny us. And listen, there are many ways to deny Christ. There are many ways to walk away from your faith. When you entertain sin, you are denying Christ. Luke says in verse chapter 9, verse 23 through 26, and Jesus was saying to them all, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself cross daily and follow me and whoever wishes to save his life will lose it but whoever loses his life for my sake will also gain it he said he will save it but what is it man what does a man profit if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself for whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in glory and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. If you deny him, he will deny you. And the last conditional clause is found here in verse 13. It says, if we are faithless you would assume that he's going to say that if he if we are faithless then he will be faithless but listen God is not responding to our faith his faith does not change 
Our, his, uh, the way that we respond does not change his character. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. Let me say that again. If we are faithless, when we are not working or walking by faith, he still is faithful. Why? Well, because he cannot deny himself. He says this in closing. 1 John 1 chapter 9 says, If we confess our sin, and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God's faithfulness need, means that he is going to do what he says regardless because he cannot deny himself. When you find yourself in the cell of circumstance, when you find yourself facing temptation, it's important for you to understand that God is faithful. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 13 says this, No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man, and God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will provide the way of escape also, so that you will be able to endure it. This morning, I want you to understand that no matter what is going on, God's word causes liberation. God's word causes salvation. And God's word causes transformation. Father, we bless your name. We thank you for the transforming power of your word. We thank you, O oh God, that your word never loses its power. And it does not lose its power because your blood never loses its power. And your blood still reaches to the highest mountains. And it still flows to the lowest valleys. Your blood still has eternal saving power. And so God, as we, as we reflect on your word, we give you honor for who you are. Father, as we prepare our hearts to receive communion, to remember the sacrifice that you made on Calvary's cross. We pray, O oh God, that you will be in our midst. You said in your word in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 that we ought to examine ourselves and that we ought not eat or drink in an unworthy manner. And so, God, we come before you to honor you, to thank you for the sacrifice that you made on Calvary's cross. You said that as often as we do this, we would do it in remembrance of you. We remember the sacrifice that you made on Calvary's cross. We remember how your body was beaten beyond recognition. We remember the blood that flowed from your body. And it is with this remembrance that we go into this communion time. Lord, we honor you. Accept this as worship. Will you bless it to our bodies as we fellowship one with another? In Jesus' name, amen.